Hey, welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 4 here in our Palo Alto studios. I'm Trevor with Dave Vellante. We've got two great guests and one of the focuses we have here is founders, how to start companies. We have two experienced founders, Piyush Sharma, who's the investor and entrepreneur, formerly sold his company to Tenable, just recently left there. Uh, it's kind of freelancing out in the open here. I'm sure he's got some grand plans, doing a lot of research. We've had, had him on before. And Vikram Yoshi, CTO and, and founder and president of Compute AI. Guys, both CUBE alumni, this topic here is important to, to me because being an entrepreneur, Dave and I have seen the waves as you guys have, your legends experience, but also you're out in the, in the arena. And, you know, the cloud was great. You put your credit card down, you can start a company. The SaaS revolution was born. AI is different. We're seeing stories of, give me two engineers and a product person and one go to market, the rest is faster. Is it faster? What do I use? How do I build the tech? What's available? Let's demystify this. As founders, welcome to this panel. Piyush, we'll start with you. As you look at the opportunities, clearly, like the web, every vertical's open for business. Okay. What's your perspective? Uh, thank you for having me here, John, first. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think this is one of the most revolutionary times we have seen, in, at least in my lifetime. After internet revolution, we are seeing a significant significant changes happening on how the cloud have been used, um, especially now the AI, LLM, it's a buzzword today. It's, it's become super easy to build a company. And uh, as long as you understand what the problem you are solving, there are sufficient amount of technology that is available. And then you can use now technology to build more technology. Like the AI, LLM today is run from cloud, for cloud, essentially changing the game of the game of the startups. And you've been an investor, so you, you've know, you know the playbook. You put some seed capital in, you get right. some VC. Dynamics are changing big time. What's your perspective on the funding? How do you get funding? I think the market needs have significantly changed in the last few months and years. Um, the, the investors always look at the white spaces, the bigger spaces like AI or LLM or similar to that. Uh, the usage of the whole uh, AI ecosystem is going to be very significant. So the money-wise, I, I personally feel there's a plenty of money available. You just need to have a problem that is important and urgent, and that's about it. That's the key. You, you still have to solve problems, right? And right. so you're in the world today. So wh what's the process that you use as a founder to go about trying to understand the problem? I mean, a lot of times we just fall back on what we know, but then you have to step back. I mean, you're in the world of data. How do you go about figuring out what problem to solve next? That's a great question, Dave. Um, I think we are playing much like what uh, Piyush said at a very important time in, in the evolution of data processing, computing, AI, ML. And we are at, at playing at a very important juncture here at a confluence of two kinds of forces that are at work. So I just want to set the tone for a little bit of the background and then we can discuss the opportunity and what it takes to be an entrepreneur and raise capital in this uh, <laughs> yes, the seemingly tough market. Uh, so it's the confluence of two major things happening here. One is you have massive amounts of data processing going on, and then there is the AI ML forces, whether it's Gen AI, LLMs, or other kinds of uh, AI ML. And there are many opportunities here, and I know the market has been saturated with conversations on Gen AI and LLMs, but there's a much larger, there's a vast amount of opportunity in the AI ML space outside of that too. From an entrepreneurial perspective, uh, understanding what the problem space is, understanding real pain points, how do you identify those? The architectural tenets of entrepreneurship haven't changed. It comes down to team. We've talked about that. Uh, people have talked about that. There's ample information. As an entrepreneur, you think you focus on the team. Great team, teams build great products. And of course, you must have a market. And it's not very easy to see the path in terms of how big is the market? Can I tap into it? Is it green fields? Is it brown fields? What are the opportunities? And that's where did, they cannot have did you, comes in. Did you raise money for your startup or did you fund it with your own cash initially? Did you raise them? And how did you capitalize that startup? So the what urgency <laughs> that I felt, <laughs> I did, I did. The first thing I did put was- Put your own money in. I put my own money in, yeah. So I put my own cash in, I went ahead and got a million dollar line of credit on top of it to make sure that uh, whatever the market conditions, 
we have the ability to continue to focus on the idea and just go after it with gusto. Uh, because once you believe, once you commit, you do not hesitate. And I think that's one of the first uh, principles of entrepreneurship, right? You have to have skin in the game. Uh, it's just between you and me. It's me and me, right? It's not <laughs> even how investors look at you. And then um, the next thing was um, there were other in investors who were interested, yeah. including people who invested in me before. So that's how Piyush, computer. We talked about happened. this. We had coffee uh, prior to coming on the program before um, with some of our friends. And we talked about opportunity recognition and that you don't really need a lot of capital to go get going. That's right. Even the seed game has changed. You can either fund it yourself because it's like the cloud days. You put your credit card down right. and you put it in the cloud. A little bit higher scale with AI, higher velocity. What's the power dynamic on the funding piece um, these days? And I know you may do a lot of mentoring of other entrepreneurs as well. What's the current state-of-the-art mindset and execution playbook for, you know, three feet in a cloud of dust, get some momentum, how do I get that next check? Yeah, and, and I think, John, you made a very good point that um, it's, it's sometime, it's all about driving a value and innovation. I think when you deal with the new technology or the new uh, hype cycle of a brand new technology like AI LLM. There are there are investors. There are sufficient number of challenges that they are up there for to be solved for by somebody by you or somebody else, right? I think the the funding is a secondary aspect of a problem that you're trying to solve. So if you really start with the right problem, most fundamental. I keep on saying that is the problem important and also urgent is where you actually start. As an entrepreneur, I, when I look at anything to invest, if I'm angel investing in a startup, I always look at that the problem, that how important it is. Is this going to be for 10 customers facing the same problem every day, or is it going to be 1,000 customers solve the, they seize this problem once in a month? And the urgency. Yeah. The urgency. Sorry to interrupt, so the, but no, I would underscore the important and urgent yeah. is where you need to start. From the investment standpoint, you, uh, just to uh, wrap, uh, wrap it up on the investment part, the investment, whether you bring it your own money, whether you bring it investors' money, you always consider it's your own money because that's the conviction that the founder yeah. needs to bring in. Once you have that conviction, money will follow, the customers will follow, and everything will start falling in place. Let's talk a little bit about markets. Yeah. You guys both compete in very large markets. You're in the data world. You're in the security world. That's right. So, the, But the data world is dominated by the big three cloud players, and then you get Snowflake and Databricks, which are seemingly... Mm -hmm. Reached escape velocity, so the market's enormous, and this big, big beast. Softly worded, yeah. That's and, the lay and, of the land there. And and in in security, highly fragmented. Really, nobody has a double-digit share. Maybe Microsoft does, but generally speaking, it's very, very fragmented. So completely different, you right. know. But but both huge. Mm -hmm. So how did you go about thinking about the problem that you wanted to solve? You you're not you burn the boats. You're not afraid of the big guys. Was it because? AI was a potential disruptor, or you saw that the existing guard was not capable of doing mm -hmm. what your vision sort of led you to? Yeah, I think just the framing of the question itself uh, is, is very powerful, and understanding who the big players are. They are the cloud players, they are the big behemoths, there's Snowflake, and there's Databricks. As an entrepreneur, I'm always looking to create value. And um, I don't view... Uh, disruption in you know in technology as being something that you decide upon. If something is going to change the game, let the customers vote on it. So how did I make the decision out there? You're playing in a very rich data landscape where um, it's a trillion dollar market or whatever the numbers are. It's a massive, massive uh, market and no one denies the fact that there is plenty of opportunity. How do you go and insert yourself as a fledgling founder with a tiny little team, with tiny resources, and create value. And in my case, I was thinking in terms of incremental but significant value where you leverage the great work done by the snowflakes of the world, by the data flakes of the world, as, and you're standing upon the shoulders of giants and creating value, which really means finding those pain points, uh, real pain points, like Piyush said, that are urgent, and you want to be able to solve them. And what we heard through all the conversations and having been in the data space um, and knowing that I'm not going to come in here and build you know, the, you know, another uh, compute engine. You don't want to be the 10th search engine and not do something like Google. 
So at the back of your mind, you know that if the problem is large enough, personally, it's not exciting to me mm. as an entrepreneur. So you always have that push and pull out there. Is this large enough? And how am I going to insert myself? And is there going to be credibility? You come out there from the left field and you say, okay, here's a data breaks. Here's a snowflake. Data management is done. You know, yeah. what's the next thing? What's the pain? And how do you go out and create value where... Um, anyone who buys your product probably already has one or both of these solutions. <laughs> yeah. And you still want to out, go out there and make it. That's clearly the case That's in your security, world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, security is exactly like that. And honestly, on the security side, right now there's so much so much noise around certain things because everybody wants to do everything. Mm -hmm. but, but nobody focuses on the main thing, which is the prevention against the breaches. And uh, every new technology brings an opportunity in the cybersecurity, mm -hmm. right? AI came in, LLM. I mean, AI ML, ML has been there for a long time. Yes. The large language model, the performance and the efficacy improves in the last few months, like when the transfer architecture came in. So I want, I want to ask you on that. But one of the things Dave and I were just talking about before you guys came on was that the CrowdStrike event right. and all these events we go to, the Cube, everyone has the same line. I want to get your reaction to it. We've been doing AI for years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, okay, they have. I have a story there, okay. too. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, you said the 10th search engine. We just engine. bought a company that's yes. doing it. Uh, and your point about the 10th search engines, Google was a nuanced point, but yeah. it's like they came right. in late the game and became dominant. Yeah. They had a different approach. What is the disruption vector that startups can take? Um, if you fresh start starting a company, you've got LLMs, you've got the yeah. foundation models. Right. What about generative AI makes it a disruptive enabler? And how do you change the game and flip the script? Is it the data? Is it the app? Is it an AI wrapper? What does AI native mean? Because I look at all the old guard stuff and say, okay, CrowdStrike might've been there, done that, they're doing it. Right. Some say they're the best at it, but is it really gonna be the next wave? What's your guy's perspective of this disruptive opportunity for the start flip question. the script? Yeah, great question, John. Actually, you put it very well uh, that everybody says that we have AI. We've already been doing AI for 20 years. The challenge is, the challenge is, the the whole what, why this disruption happening now because of the consumerization of the AI. AI has been AI and ML has been a very niche, very specialized platform in the last few years. But the whole uh, launch of OpenAI, ChatGPT has consumerized AI in the hands of actual end users. Very well stated, right? Yeah. The whole. So AI has become commodity. Large language foundation model, there are like 10 of those foundation model available. And even to the extent that the, there are the models which are region specific. Like there was one company got funded in Europe who solves only the, the Europe specific, the, the, the Europe specific problems around foundation model. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole commoditization, which is where everybody gets a hand on something or other, an application that uses AI, or being secured by AI, I think that's the that's the change we're talking about. It always starts in consumer, though. Even in data, it started with the Google file system, right? right, right. Search, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. And 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 an example of that is, you know, I had someone who who worked with me in the AML space was the lead engineer. Is the lead engineer? Remember one of these applications. Um, in Gmail, as you type, it completes the sentences yeah. on you. That's a massive generative AI LLM model using millions of whatever TPUs out there at Google. And it's been around for a long time. But it's that commercialization and the commoditization. It's like search and chat GPT are now starting to compete. And I think that gives it yeah. wings. So I want to get back to <laughs> but the, ML I has wanna, been there. I want to get back to the consumerization point because LLMs, and we just showed our power law chart on our intro segment that the size of the models are changing. You've got smaller models. The, the flip is script. I'm here with the word proprietary okay. and walled gardens a lot. And OpenAI was, is, was called, is called the proprietary model. Actually, it's more open. Mm -hmm. right? And other models in the long tail are proprietary intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So data is now the IP. Okay, yes. So you look at that. So people are putting a walled garden around it, but yet it interacts with other data. So the question is, how do you look at the data aspect of it from the perspective of security? Now, does security mean securing against breaches or just knowing that something's truthful? What if synthetic data gets in there? How do you know what's real and what's not real if the consumerization is here, and to your point, my daughter was texting me a new app she's using to write her emails for. Mm -hmm. She's just graduated college. So they're already using it. Apps are coming out, AI wrapper app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. What's the next generation? What is that security posture? Is it about truth? Is it about breaches? All the above? 
yeah so i i'll take this i'll take a 10 second attempt to explain that what is an impact of this llm on cybersecurity and this is just my definition there's by no there's no standard on this there are four dimensions on which that ai llm has been impacting cybersecurity now one is your cyber offense which is where a lot of ai will be used to breach the system creating ddos attacks or a lot of threats vectors will generate come out of the ai llm there's a foundation model were created in the dark web which just creates the the malwares so you can imagine now more and more data is translating to that number 2 is a cyber defense so a lot of ai usage is starting to happen to prevent breaches very contradictory right there's one is to use attack one is to prevent and then there is a social responsible aspect of the ai that hey whether my ai because it's generative needs to be socially responsible etc and the last is the fourth dimension is preventing attacks on ai itself so if every company if the planet is going to use an ai infrastructure you need controls that will prevent breaches on ai to the last point which john mentioned the data data is so critical because data has become the threat vector in the industry for the first time it's not the user it's not any it's not the infrastructure it's the data so you use data to exfiltrate the data you create prompts so that you can ex- you can exfiltrate the pri- private and pri- uh, you know pii information so it's a very it's a that's why it's a very transient it's a transient time but it's a very significant change the way the yeah. security solution have been built. and by the way everything you just said is reality happening now yeah. and the old standards were siloed data warehouses old data modeling old compliance yeah. so governance compliance all have to adjust, adjust. rapidly exactly and and some companies are conservative they don't know what to do yep. yet it's changing so fast that's right so the question is what side of the street will you be and landing on the yeah. good side or the the side that goes away no i think i think you you have to lean on both side because we're unfortunately or fortunately remain in hybrid uh, mode for a longer period of time like private to public data center and i I'm, i'm seeing ai as a complete treasure tree as cloud initially there was challenges in adoption mm-hmm. there were risk chasm which companies sort of companies were built around solving the adoption problem the same thing is happening in ai also yeah well as vikram said it all comes down to to value and the promise of right. ai is is going to drive productivity up right. i think it in in your world the the sock analyst experience is is going to is changing absolutely dramatically and then with so much more we can do with with data Uh, what do you guys think about the sort of timing of when we're actually going to see maybe it's happening already but it's still not meaningful on numbers that we're actually going to see ai have the impact that is promised um i i feel that where we are in the industry with um data data management these were massive problems creating systems of records right you can call them silos or not does not matter but solving those problems the kinds of problems that say snowflake has solved i think that's been a massive step that we need to leverage and catapult ourselves to the next level what happens beyond that and there is another point of inflection here and again you need to bring in ai ml into the picture it's it's, it's, it's important i do have a separate comment on the synthetic versus the real part of the data and that has to do with uh uh with what's happening with cloud data warehouses with lake houses um data formats the moment you take a data warehouse or you take a table and you flatten it and turn that into say a parquet file mm. at that point you unshackled compute from the confines of say a database or a data warehouse at that point you it's it's may the best compute engine win and there are many out there but the ability to good liberate for, compute for users <laughs> <laughs> well yeah democratization right you don't have to use the cloud vendors compute necessarily you mean right that's that's locked and, and even think, though they're separate we've talked about and that. compute for all right compute is the oxygen for data for data processing mm-hmm. right i mean we we don't pay pay for the air we breathe and we are being productive we are being entrepreneurs we are creating uh, incredible value and hoping to change the world so to have to pay for oxygen i don't think i, I you want to make compute abundant <laughs> and we now have arrived upon the opportunity here um, where between parquet and formats such as iceberg or delta or hudi doesn't matter mm-hmm. it's data and metadata 
you can now have some very powerful compute platforms which are far simpler because I, you know, maybe this may not be that relevant, but at least I'll sow the seed here uh, for maybe a future conversation. What's important here is, and especially coming here with my roots in databases, having had something to do with Exadata, uh, when I look at a database, you look at databases as having to do ETL is done, then you take the data and you push that into rows, columns, tuples, whatever, into tables, right? Things with schemas, there's DDL and DML, there's transactions, and then you have DQL, which is your query. With Parquet and Iceberg or Delta, which are very powerful standards, what you've done is you've taken DDL and DML out of the equation. You've taken transaction processing out of the picture. You've taken snapshots, checkpoints, everything out of the picture. And now you're left with a pure read-only compute engine with the power of being able to do transaction processing. You're able to do point-in-time rollbacks, you know, all of those features of databases. So I think we have arrived upon uh, a new feature if I may just connect the dots on the AI ML side of it. <laughs> well, we got we to wrap up, but I want to put a pin in that. We'll follow up. The computer's oxygen. I love that line. We have one quick question to end the segment for you guys. For sure. Founders, yeah. other entrepreneurs out there, we are in historic time. It feels like the web. Right. It's going to grow. Without what opportunity recognition techniques should the younger generation watching this or anyone in the enterprise trying to figure out how to be less conservative, more aggressive without failing or getting over their skis, as they say, what advice would you give from a rock opportunity recognition? What's real? What's a company, not a feature? What, do, what would you guys say to that, that, that question? I, I, if I would start, I will give only one advice. Talk to customers. Talk to the real users of the AI infrastructure. That is how you will define how things need to be built. Right. Talk to them. Talk as much as you can. Great. And I would add to that, supplement that, and say, talk to investors too, because they have talked to many, many founders. They've gone through 40 pitches or more and suffered through that a week. And what they possess is that information which you can rapidly access. I'd rather, um, I'd benefit from the intuition of maybe five bright minds than 10,000 rational thinkers. And I think between talking to real customers and talking to you know smart yeah. strategic investors, you have it covered. It's a great, it's a great point. And remember the dot com bubble, not that it, it did burst, but it ended up happening. Everything that they invested in did happen. The spray and pray approach was the best. Spread the seeds out on the soil, let exactly. them gr let them grow. Exactly. Just the amounts might differ. Absolutely. Vikram, thank you for coming on. I wish we had more time. Great panel. Great to see you guys. As always, expert contribution here on SuperCloud Four. Generative AI generating tons of opportunities for entrepreneurs and innovators to change the game. The script will flip. This next generation is here and is growing. We've got the next interview coming. Brian Harris, CTO of SaaS, a company that's been around for a long time, still private, does billions of dollars. His approach and his vision how to take conservative approach, but yet aggressive with AIs up next. We'll be right back, thank you.